My name is Shay Mensel. I was diagnosed in June 2018 at 29 years old, and I was diagnosed with stage two hormone positive breast cancer. My first thoughts when I was diagnosed were de it was definitely shock. Um, I kind of gave myself 24 hours to sit with it and not tell anybody except my husband. And then I said after that 24 hours, I was gonna pick myself up off the floor and keep going and that's what I did. So I kind of sat with it and then I kind of went right into fight mode. So my treatment protocol, because of the size of the tumor, I, was, well, I wasn't able to do a lumpectomy. I had to do a mastectomy on that side. So I opted to do a double mastectomy and that's where we started. And then based on that pathology, we would decide if I needed chemo or not. Um, turns out I did need chemotherapy because of my oncotype and chance of recurrence. So right before we jumped into chemo, my husband and I froze embryos to preserve, you know, in case we want to have a family in the future and then went into four rounds of chemo. And then after the chemo, I had reconstructive surgery. And then about six weeks after that, I had six weeks of radiation. When you're diagnosed with cancer, you feel, your whole world feels out of your control. And when I was told I needed chemo and that I would lose my hair, all of my hair after the first round, um, I kind of, it was, I kind of just accepted it that that might happen and that I kind of was just surrendering to the experience at that point. I'd already lost my breast, possibly was about to lose my fertility. So it just felt like one more thing. Um, but I actually think it was harder to hear that than to hear I had to lose my breasts. Cause I think at least you know, losing your breasts, you can kind of hide it and yeah, I can stay private to you, but once you're a woman, especially a young woman, walking around bald, everybody knows why. Losing your breast is a grieving process. Um, it's a body part, it's an amputation, and it's a really big deal. And I don't think, I obviously didn't realize how big a deal it was until I went through it, um, but there was definitely I think I still grieve that I don't have them. I mean, I was diagnosed at 29, and if I am lucky enough to have children, I'll never be able to breastfeed. So that is still something that sits with me often, actually. Um, and then to hear I'm gonna lose my hair too, it just felt like I was com being completely stripped of myself and not really sure, you know, who I was when I was looking in the mirror anymore. take control of my self-image, I kind of tried to keep things as, things as normal as possible. I'm really active. I love to exercise. Um, and so I tried to keep doing that as much as I could, even if it was just going for a walk with my dog. Um, we bought spin bikes because I was having trouble with mobility in my upper body. So we bought spin bikes so I could do that. Um, I think just trying to keep my activity level as high as I could really helped with my mental health and my self-image and how I saw myself. Um, and then I think too, just embracing that this is what I look right now. You know, I lost my eyebrows, I lost my eyelashes and it was just kind of like, oh, well, this is what I look like right now. So just kind of have to embrace every part of it and really just know that, you know, it really is as cliche as it sounds on the inside what matters. We found out about scalp pulling therapy. Um, my mom found it actually. I think soon after I was diagnosed, obviously chemo was brought up in the first meeting with my doctor and that was what scared me the most was losing my hair actually. And which I found is very common for most women. And she actually Googled, is there any way to not lose your hair during chemotherapy? Which I, none of us had ever thought that she would get an answer yes to that. And she found out that yes, in fact there is, and women have been doing it in Europe and Australia for 20 plus years and saving their hair, especially during breast cancer treatment. 
And so we looked into it a little bit more um, once we found out that I needed a chemo and I started reaching out and finding people that had done it here in the States. Um, and essentially what it does is it's a cap you wear during your, about an hour before your chemotherapy treatment, during your entire infusion and about four to eight hours afterwards. And what it does is it freezes the hair follicles so that the chemo can't get to the hair follicle so it doesn't fall out. Um, chemo goes to warmth and so it's not attracted to the cold areas. Um, so it's very cold. It's about negative 35, maybe a little bit colder than that. So it's definitely a very long brain freeze. I wanted to try it because I felt like all at once everything was kind of being taken from me and things that I had, you know, you always, I always planned to be a mother and now that was kind of a question mark. I would never breastfeed. Like I felt like everything was so out of my control that I wanted to just take some control back almost as like a middle finger to the experience and like you, you can take all you want, but I'm going to fight back. Um, and when I brought it up to my doctor, cause I was asking my doctors about it. Have you heard about cold cap therapy? Um, do you know anyone who's done it? And my oncologist told me not to do it, actually. He said it would hurt too bad and it wouldn't work. And he only knew one woman who did it and she was a model, so she probably needed her hair. And it was that comment, actually, that was fuel to my fire because I wanted to prove him wrong. So when I walked into my second treatment and I wasn't bald, his mouth was definitely on the floor. I kind of responded to him like, okay, that's nice. And then inside I'm like, you know, kind of like I'm going to prove you wrong. And I just told him I was going to try it. And he just said, okay. Um, and now he's really changed his tune and wants to get the uh, machines or the caps provided for more women at the hospital I treatment at. So it was definitely a positive experience for him because I think it taught him, you know, to listen to his patients a little bit more too. And it also helped me just advocate for myself and know that it's my body and I'm gonna push back for what I for what I want and what I think is right and what I need. So the process of using scalp cooling therapy is intense um, and you definitely need support, which I was really lucky to have. My husband, my mom and mother-in-law and I, and then sometimes my dad, we would show up to the chemo floor like we were coming to a tailgate um, we would have a giant core of dry ice that we would use to keep all of the caps at the perfect temperature um, and then I would kind of sit down in the chair and we would get started and we would do two caps before the infusion even started to get my head cold enough um, and then we would change them every 25 minutes for the next four to five hours of my infusion, and then we would get home. <laughs> we would be sometimes changing the cap in the car, and then we would get home and we would sit um, on the couch and watch TV and then change them for another four hours. So it was usually a total of like eight to 10 hours each time. Um, and my husband was kind of our cap leader and he would rotate the caps in the dry ice, you know, kind of burning his hands all day, making sure they were cold enough before they went on my head. Um, and it worked, it was, you know, it was uncomfortable, but after the first 10 minutes or so, your head really goes numb. And it ended up being an actually very positive experience because I think it helped my husband and my parents heal a little bit because they felt like they couldn't do anything for me and finally they could. Um, and it's because of them that I have hair. So I'm, I'm very grateful to all of them for helping me and, be will and willing to give up their day. And it, you know, it was exhausting, so I'm really grateful to them. After about 10 minutes, your head does go numb. Um, it feels, I guess, like your head's burning, um, like freezer burning, and essentially it is. Uh, and then it, without fail, about five to six days after every treatment, my some of my scalp would peel off because it was frozen. So and it's hard because this, the hair care, you have to be so careful not to 
put any stress on your hair follicles. So you can't wash it very much. Um, you definitely can't be pulling at it to get the, you know, dandruff out from your scalp flaking off. So I felt like I was kind of just rocking greasy dandruffy hair for a while, but it didn't bother me because I was just so happy to have hair on my head that the whole process of having to wash your hair in cold water every time you washed it, only being able to wash every three days or less, um, I kind of just got used to it. My husband, like I said, we called him our cap leader um, and he definitely drove the ship in telling everybody what to do. Luckily, I just got to sit there. Um, but I guess I had the hard job of wearing the freezing cold cap. And then my mom, who found scalp pulling, we wouldn't even have done it if she hadn't done that simple Google search. Um, and my mother-in-law too, she would, sh you know, she was also there at every infusion. Her and my mom were in charge of changing my cap and my husband was in charge of rotating the caps to keep them cold. And my mother-in-law would also bring tons of snacks and tons of food to keep us fueled throughout the day. So um, then and then my dad would come and the caps get really hard as the day goes on because they're sitting on the dry ice so they get really cold and hard. So my dad would come about an hour or two into my infusion and he would start massaging the caps. So we kind of had this system down um, and they were definitely my, my core team. I think going through the whole thing, it's like kind of a difficult situation, I think, as a caregiver. Uh, I know me specifically, I'm the kind of person who likes to fix things. And it was really hard for me to not be able to fix this thing. I feel like the whole thing feels um, like her power is being taken away. because So much stuff is being controlled by doctors and treatment and you just totally feel powerless, really. So I think it's a matter of like trying to grab a hold onto the things that you you can. Sometimes I think it's helpful just to have a hand to hold or somebody to talk to. I was very happy with my scalp pulling results. I lost about less, probably less than 10% of my hair. Um, and it's honestly the thickest and longest it's been in years. And I finished chemo a year and a half ago. Um, I still look in the mirror every day and I'm astounded. Like, I'm like, wait, is that really my hair? Um, so yeah, too astounded by the results, honestly. I didn't really believe it would work, but I guess I actually did believe it would work because I had no backup plan. The day I was supposed to start losing my hair in chunks, I was in my one of my best friend's weddings and I didn't have a wig, uh, so I guess I did think it was going to work because I had no backup plan, so. People often say hair is just hair, and I, I don't agree with that, actually. And it's not the aesthetic for why I wanted to keep it. Um, it was really just trying to hold on two pieces of myself when everything was being kind of torn away from me. And I did, and I think too, you know, no one really talks about the after treatment and how hard that is. Um, the anxiety and depression I felt were truly unavoidable and, but also surprising at the same time. But I think because I quickly started to look like myself again, that, I was able to start healing sooner. Um, I was able to look in the mirror and kind of see a resemblance of who I was before all this. And I think that was, that's a huge silver lining of having hair. Um, there is a downside to it though. And I think that's that people forget. And it's not that you want them to remember, but I did feel, especially with you know work and just, you know, general commitments, just because I didn't look sick or just because things, you know, I was carrying it well and because I had hair, people thought I was carrying it well. It didn't mean it wasn't really heavy. So I think that's definitely the downside of it, but the positives definitely outweighed the negatives, obviously. 
I would definitely recommend scalp cooling. We've actually trained some people on how to do it and I'm constantly trying to advocate for it. I just believe that it, the option to keep your hair and take back some control is so empowering for the person going through a cancer experience that it's, I absolutely would recommend it. And I would recommend at least just trying it because if it ends up being too difficult to do or you don't feel it's working fully for you, you can always stop. But I always recommend, you know, just at least try it. Keeping my hair empowered me because I was able to kind of take something back and take control back in a way. And, you know, everything was kind of a question mark for me at that point. And I was really having to surrender to this experience and to what was best treatment wise in order to survive. And with that surrendering came a, you know, a surrendering of myself in many ways. And keeping my hair just allowed me to keep a piece of me um, and to just say, you know, you're not gonna take everything. And I think it was just really empowering too to control my narrative. And, you know, I could still go out to eat, go to concerts and not feel like everyone was staring at me because I was a young, sick person. Um, I looked really tired, but people didn't know that I was sick and I could share that if I wanted to, but I could also keep that to myself if I wanted to. And that was really empowering to be able to control my narrative. Beauty to me equals confidence. Um, and that's confidence in who you are and in your story and being grounded in your story without shame or regret. That's beauty to me.